Welcome, I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, uh, featuring a conversation with zoologist and author Bill Shutt about his book, Pump, A Natural History of the Heart. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out the link tomorrow um, in case you'd like to watch it again or share it with a friend. Um, we'll be taking questions via chat and we ask that you please save your questions until the end of the event and we will we'll get to as many as possible. Just like to take a quick moment and let everyone know about an another upcoming event um, on Wednesday, July 27th at 6 p.m. Uh, board certified veterinary nutritionist Lisa Weiss will join us for Pet Food Basics, choosing the right diet for your dog or cat. You can register for that event on our website, amcny.org slash event. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Hohenhaus, who will moderate tonight's event. Dr. Hohenhaus is a senior veterinarian in Schwarzman AMC's oncology service and is double board certified in oncology and small animal internal medicine. Dr. Hohenhaus is also a veterinary journalist who has written for many news outlets and she hosts a monthly radio show, Ask the Vet on Sirius XM, which is also available as a podcast. And we at the USAN Institute are incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Hohenhaus as our veterinary advisor. Uh, we're grateful for all that she does on our behalf, which includes being with us to lead tonight's event. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Oh, thanks so much, Michelle, for having me. And I just want to be sure I happen to know Lisa Weath personally, who's speaking at um, your next event. And Lisa's wonderful and so uh if you're interested in nutrition for your pets you definitely need to sign up to to hear lisa talk um so welcome to all our attendees um as well i'm so happy to be here tonight i have a really special guest tonight who is a fellow cornelian bill shoot and we're going to talk about his book pump uh the natural history of the heart and we'll take audience questions at the end of the of the our 15 minutes of our hour. So Dr. Schutt is a professor emeritus of biology at LIU Post and is also a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History. And for our listeners, um, as an aside, uh, LIU has one of the newest colleges of veterinary medicine uh, in the United States. I think they have two, uh, two years of classes in, so it'll be another two years before any of those graduates might be um, taking care of your pets. Um, Bill was born in New York City and raised on Long Island by his parents who encouraged his passion for the natural world. He received a PhD in zoology from Cornell in 1995 and held a postdoctoral fellowship at the American Museum of Natural History, where he received a Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Grant. Dr. Schutt has published dozens of articles on topics ranging from terrestrial locomotion in vampire bats to the precarious arboreal copulation behaviors of the marsupial mouse. His research has been featured in the New York Times, Newsday, Discover, and The Economist. And we just heard that he's going to be featured in an upcoming article on cannibalism in the New York Times. He's currently working on a nonfiction book on teeth and has also finished the first draft of his solo novel. So I'm so happy that you can be here with me today, Bill. Uh, thanks for joining us here on the book club. Thanks, Anne. Nice to be back. Nice to talk to you again. Good to talk to you. Bill and I chatted on uh, Ask the Vet uh, in last month's show. Um, so I know from speaking with you on, on Ask the Vet that one of your favorite stories from Pump is the story about the whale heart. So just to give the audience a perspective on the size of the whale heart, here's a photo of you and the whale's heart. Can you tell us, like, how is this heart there so that you can touch it sitting on a pedestal? Well, it's been plastinated. I don't know if your audience or if you're familiar with the, uh, the, the live bodies exhibitions that they've been having. And, um, you know, basically they take flesh and, and, and turn it into a, 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 a form of plastic. And this is the largest structure that, uh, that was ever plastinated. They, they actually did the work over a five year period that it took to preserve this heart in, uh, in, in Germany. Uh, but it but it started off as as something very different. It it started off as a tragedy where where nine blue whales 
were uh, well, died. They were they, they, we believe they got stuck under an ice flow in, in, in Newfoundland. And, um, and usually blue whales sink when they die. So not a lot was known about their anatomy. And so some of my friends at the Royal Ontario Museum who studied whales for a long time had, had heard these questions over and over again. What's the largest heart in the world? Well, it's a blue whale heart. How big is it? Uh, it's the uh, size of an SUV. Uh, but they really didn't know. And, and so when they got a chance to, 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 to get one of these hearts because three of the whales didn't sink. Uh, they sent a, a crew and, and really it was kind of like a, a, a heavy construction crew to, to go up to Newfoundland and to, to, to carve into this uh, 90 ton animal and, and, and take its heart out. Uh, and, and when they saw this thing, it, it, it really surprised them in so many ways and it still continues to surprise them. Uh, it, you know, to me, when I saw pictures of it initially, it looked like a you know, a, a 300 pound soup dumpling, it, it just collapsed. Uh, and so there are vessels that you see here in this photograph that they still don't quite know what those vessels are. Um, but to make a long story short, the, the, some of the things that they, that they discovered about, the, about this heart, when, once they did this amazing job of, of, of plastinating it over in Germany and then sending it back and then allowing the researchers to, 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 to study it, was that it was a lot smaller than they thought it was going to be. So uh, th that was really intriguing. You know, for example, if, the, if you were looking at a 90 ton hummingbird, it would have a heart that would weigh probably eight times as much as that blue whale heart does. So the question becomes why? And, and we think the answer has to do with the fact that, that a hummingbird, uh, its, its heart rate is about, you know, first of all, its wings beat at, at 80 times per second. And in order to do that, in order to supply the, blood to those wing muscles, you've got a heart that beats 1260 times per minute uh, to, in order to pump out enough blood to get to supply those muscles. Now, the only other, we think that's about the limit that, that, that a heart can actually beat 1260 times per minute. Uh, so the only other way to to, to get by the fact that you may be at the mechanical limit of how fast a heart can beat is to have a heart that's larger. Uh, and, and so that's why animals like hummingbirds and shrews that have a high metabolic rate uh, have such a large hearts and, and why their hearts beat so quickly. Um, so there, there are vessels in this photograph that are not analogous to our heart. Is that what you're, what you, I heard you say? Yeah, pretty amazing. I, I, at least initially, they may have worked it out by now. I'm, I mean, I'm certain they know if these are veins or arteries, but, but they didn't quite know where where they were headed uh and now i think they probably have a better idea because they've got they were able to recover another heart not from a blue whale but but from a, a from a, a related baleen whale where they can make these comparisons and, and as you know when you if you can compare species that are different but in in some ways similar then you can learn a lot from them i'm sure they were able to 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 figure out hopefully by now where these vessels are going and where they're coming from but yeah, there's, I mean, a lot, there's a lot that, that's still uh, mysterious about these. Why did they collapse like a soup dumpling where uh, when, you know, if this was a, a human heart or a cow heart, if you, if you saw it laying there, it would have form. It would be sort of as, as, as you, I think you mentioned, sort of rubbery looking. Uh, but here, this thing just collapsed. Uh, well, and, and it, they think that may have something to do with diving. I mean, think about the chicken. If you buy chicken hearts in the grocery store, you know, they, they look like little hearts. Uh, they're, they're not flattened at all. Um, I don't know, can, is my pointer visible on this picture? Uh, maybe no. Um, but I think, I think the big vessel low in there coming towards us is the vena cava. And then I think the vessel coming out the top and turning around, oh, there it is. Um, yeah, that's, I think the pointer is on what's the vena cava, which is the major return to the heart. And sure. then up top of the heart, there's a vessel that starts to curve a little mm -hmm. bit towards the right. Yep, that one, I bet that's the aorta, which yep. is the main artery coming out of the heart. So it's, it's, it's still recognizable as a heart, although it doesn't have that little heart shape that, right. that we associate with the heart. Um, yeah, it's sort of bifurcated at the yeah. you know, at the apex, which is kind of weird instead of coming to a point like a, a typical mammalian heart. Yeah. So, there, so there's a lot about this that was, you know, that was surprising to them. You know, you know, the key thing being that it was it was a lot, you know, it was it, of course it's large, but it was a lot smaller than they thought it was going to be. Well, it's they, nowhere near an SUV. It's like a smart car. <laughs> yeah, that's what they uh, put up. 
that's what they that they were going to have it next to a a, a car and and they wound up putting it next to uh to, to a smart car uh, yeah. when they did the yeah. initial uh, uh exhibition can can people go see this it, it's on exhibition now it, actually they brought it back when i went up there they had they they had pulled down i didn't find out about it until after they pulled the exhibit down but it's now back up there and the and the royal ontario museum which is a fantastic place in, in toronto is now open to the public and and yes you can go in there and see this heart and it's uh it is spectacular um yeah i never saw the bodies exhibition but it sounded pretty spectacular to me as well um that it was downtown in new york for a long time at the seaport yeah yeah, so so you've got this person. It's like uh, you know they're dribbling a basketball, and it looks like a human, except they have no skin. Um, and you know there was there was certainly some controversy surrounding that 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 exhibit, but uh, but it's it was it's an amazing uh, thing to see if you if you, if you or your viewers get a chance to see. Yeah, it. yeah, I, I'm sure that it was. I just. I don't know. There's always so much to see in New York. I didn't quite get it together for that. So let's change topics a little bit. And when, you know, this is the Queen's Jubilee year. So everyone's thinking about uh, Buckingham Palace and Blue Bloods, which would be the Queen and her ancestors, except they aren't actually the original Blue Bloods. So tell me who the original Blue Bloods are and why is their blood blue? Well, first of all, why is our blood red? And, and that's because ah, good of question. this oxygen carrying molecule called, that everybody has heard of called hemoglobin. And in that molecule uh, is, is iron. And when iron and oxygen come together, so, so what this thing does is it circulates around the blood. And when it comes in contact with oxygen, it latches onto it. So then you have oxyhemoglobin. When oxygen and iron link, they're red. And you can you can remind yourself of that when you think of a sort of a, a a a rusted iron fence is red, okay. Now, when you look throughout the animal kingdom at animals like insects or horseshoe crabs or lobsters or 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 crab blue claw crabs, a lot of animals have don't have hemoglobin. Um, they have something called hemocyanin, and instead of iron being the 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 you know, found in in this uh, in in this oxygen carrying pigment, they have copper, and so when copper links onto oxygen, it turns what color? Blue. Blue. Yeah. And if you can prove that by looking at the Statue of Liberty, so that's why their blood is blue uh, as com when it's oxygenated compared to um, to our blood or m mammalian blood, um, which is red when it's when it's carrying oxygen. And what, what do you think made, like, what's the evolutionary advantage to hemoglobin versus hemocyanin? Does somebody know why? Like, because most of the animals with hemocyanin are lower, I, I hate to say that, they're, they're not as evolved, shall we say, as, as humans are, or mammals, or birds, which have red blood. So what's the advantage or disadvantage? Yeah, great question. Uh, hemoglobin is more efficient at, 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 at carrying oxygen than, than, than hemocyanin is. So that's, that, that's the short answer. Uh, but they both work perfectly well. You know, one of the themes of this book is we've got to get away from the idea that just because it's, for example, hemocyanin doesn't mean that it's faulty or, or that it's primitive. Uh, because it works perfectly well and it has evolved over probably millions and millions of years to do the job that it's doing. And just because what we have, like, for example, our heart might be more complex, doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It's just different. Yeah. So, yeah. And, 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 and you saw that you can see that throughout the animal kingdom when you look at, at things that some people would call a heart. And, and then if you, if you were to ask a cardiologist, he would go, oh, that's not a heart. That's, it, it, it doesn't have uh, you know, an endothelial lining. So it's, uh, you know, that's not a card carrying heart, uh, but it does the job. It, it, it pumps a fluid throughout the body that, that carries nutrients and, and, and waste products, nutrients to the tissues, waste products away. In many instances, oxygen to the tissues carbon dioxide away in some cases across the 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 insects for example uh, there's no gas carrying capability by by what you would you know what you might call blood um 
He, but, so hemoglobin is actually a nasty molecule and hemoglobin is inside your red blood cells for a good reason. And that is because those red blood cells are protecting the body from the toxic effects of hemoglobin. And when, if you have a blood transfusion that is not a, the right match and the red blood cells are destroyed by your body, that heat, that hemoglobin that leaks out of those damaged red blood cells will make you really, really sick. It damage your kidneys. <laughs> um, and so hemoglobin is a great molecule and it's in its place, but it, out of the place, it can be a bad actor. Sure. Can uh, I put in a public service announcement while we're course. still on the- uh, on We the can talk about anything. Hemoglobin. Uh, and that's that people hear about, about carbon monoxide and how dangerous it is. And, and, and a lot of times I get the feeling from talking to people that they don't know why it is as dangerous as it is and why small amounts of, of carbon monoxide especially are dangerous. And the reason, to, to, to put it briefly, is that if, if hemoglobin is more efficient at carrying oxygen than, than, uh, than hemocyanin, then carbon monoxide is much more efficient at latching onto oxygen than hemoglobin is. And so even a, a little tiny bit of carbon monoxide is going to latch onto any oxygen that's present, which means that you're not going to get that oxygen delivered to where it needs to go. Because the carbon monoxide's got all the oxygen tied up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's another, another good point about uh, oxygen binding. Um, so I like that one. Um, so let's change from the blue bloods and we'll talk about an animal that's more familiar maybe to people. And that would be a horse. And so we have a wonderful illustration from pump, uh, and all the illustrations are, as you can see, are, are done by Patricia J. Wynn. And this is a beautiful, um, illustration, um, of a horse. And when a horse runs, um, it has a secondary blood pumping mechanism or kind of a power assist, if you will. Can you talk about that and, and explain what's shown in this diagram? Yeah, the, the reason that I brought this up was because it was one of the first papers that, that my mentor at Cornell, John Hermanson, gave me to read. And it was a paper by Dennis Bramble and, uh, and Dave Carrier that was done in the 1990s. And, and, and the take home message was that, that, that organs don't really exist in a vacuum, that, that, that you, you know, if, if you're looking at an organ that's a, that's a respiratory organ, uh, then, then there are other things going on that besides the fact that you've got lungs working to move uh, 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 air in and out of the body. And, and, um, and, and this instance, here's something that, was, that, that I found incredibly fascinating. And, and it was just because I was looking for an example of, you know, I was working on, um, I was working on horseshoe crabs and the fact that their gills actually help circulate their, their blood. And here was, a, was an example where, um, just, just to be brief here, our, our lungs fill and, and, um, and empty because of changes in our thoracic cavity, the chamber that, that surrounds our lungs, the volume of that chamber changes. And when the, when the volume increases, right, the, the pressure inside those, uh, the, the lungs drops and air rushes into the lungs. When the volume of the thoracic cavity in decreases, it increases the pressure in the thoracic cavity, squeezes on the lungs and sends, the blood, uh, sends that air out. So that's typical. Now, the thing is, is that that gets an assist from the, uh, from the diaphragm. The diaphragm is what moves up and down, changing the volume of the thoracic cavity and therefore changing the pressure. What, what Bramble and Carrier figured out though, is that, that, that th this respiratory system gets an assist by the fact that attached to the diaphragm, and you can see it here, is a, uh, is a ligament called a falciform ligament that attaches the diaphragm to the liver. And when the horse is running, the liver moves back and forth in the abdominal cavity. And it, as it moves backwards, it pulls on the diaphragm, increasing the thoracic cavity volume. And when it slams forward against the diaphragm, it compresses, it pushes against the diaphragm and compresses the volume inside the thoracic cavity. So it's really an assist to the normal breathing of a horse. And I just found it fascinating. And it was, it was really one of the papers that, that, um, that, that stood out is this, this visceral pump 
something that you would never expect to see. And so on a day-to-day -day basis as a veterinarian, we see the effect of respiration on the heart rate because when dogs are breathing, they'll breathe in and the heart rate slows down a little bit and then they breathe out and their heart rate increases a little bit. And so that it's very common and it's associated with respiration. If you do an EKG, you'll see a little bit increase in heart rate and then you'll see it slow down a little bit. And that's because that heart is inside that thoracic cavity and it's, its rate is influenced by um, the respiration. So it has a name, it's called a respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Um, and we, we hear that every single day because the heart is in the middle of that diaphragm, lungs, thoracic cavity thing. Uh, so it, it's, it, I, I never heard it described that way before, but it's exactly right. The, the organs are not, they, they are not exist in a, not in a vacuum. It, they are affected by the rest of the creature. Yeah, great, great point. I always made a point to, another point, to, to tell my students that, that it was unfortunate that anatomy and physiology textbooks were set up in chapters because the idea being that you could study the, uh, you know, the, you could study the respiratory system and then take an exam and then, and then just forget that stuff. And then you could go to the circulatory system and, and learn that, but they are intimately tied together. And, and so, 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 so thinking of them as chapters in a text is absolutely the wrong way to think about organ systems. So but how the, would you how would you rewrite the book? Why are you not <laughs> rewriting that book? I just maybe I would put that quote at the beginning of every chapter. You know, don't forget what you just learned. Tie yeah. it into you know that sort of thing. You know, you can't. I mean, if you think about it, if you're looking at at, at motion, you you can't teach about movement of, of the human body, for example, just by looking at the skeletal system. You've got to look at the muscular system. You've got to look at, and then look at the nerves, the nervous system, because it is what is causing the muscles to contract. And you can't just look at bones because you've got to look at joints. So, so there's, there's this, you know, there are many, many different things that come into play when you're talking about, about, about function in, in a body. And, and it's, it's easy to sort of simplify it especially if you're a non-scientist and you just go, all right, well, I'm going to move on now. I've, I've taken the, that, that, that exam. I, I can sort of forget this stuff by the time I get out to my car, uh, but that's just not the way it works. Well, and, and you know, I think movement's got to be one of the most complicated things because there's everything you just talked about, but then also there is the fact that your eyes feed to your brain, like what's around you, don't step in that hole that's coming up and also help. You've got a balance system that keeps you from toppling over as you're walking forward that you don't fall to the left or to the right. So movement, it, it's actually amazing that, that I can get up and walk down the hall when you think about how complicated it really is. And we do it. We don't, we don't really think about it at all. Um, so that's, that, that's a, a really um, complicated process is just moving from here oh, to sure. there. I, I, I mean, that's what I studied when I was at Cornell was, was locomotion. And, and, and I happened to look at terrestrial locomotion in bats, which is not something that you'd think of. But when you look at vampire bats, they're running around on the ground uh, like little spiders. And, and what is it about? You know, and, and, and I looked at the hind legs, you know, and, and here you have all of the typical mammal anatomy, but the knees are, are 180 degrees reversed or up to 180 degrees reversed. So think of your knees facing backwards. That's what you've got in a, in, in a, in, in a common vampire bat. How, are, how does that system allow this creature to run, to jump two, three feet into the air? Um, so that, that's where, you know, that, that's where I, uh, I sort of made my bones in the, in the, in the bat research community by, by looking at at, at the limbs and bats that, 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 that not a lot of people were looking at. Everybody was, was of course, interested in the wings, but, but I was able to go in and, and, and do a lot of work comparing uh, this terrestrial locomotive ability and these three fascinating creatures, vampire bats, which hadn't been studied very well. That, well, it had been studied, but most of, the, most of the work had been done on one of the three species. Two of them were really open books in the 1990s, which was a massive plus for me because I could so, go in and do whatever I wanted. I have to say, I have this vision in my mind of vampire bats swooping in mm -hmm. and biting their victim. And possibly I watched too many 
um, horror <laughs> movies late at night, you know? So, so they, um, from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like they swoop in and oh, no. bite their victim on the neck. No, they're very, very careful, very, very stealthy. And, and I wrote a book called Dark Banquet, Blood in the Curious Lives of Blood Feeding Creatures. It was my first nonfiction book. And, and really a take home message was that if you're gonna feed on blood, then, then there are things that you share, you know, w w whether you are a leech or a tick or a vampire bat. And those are things like you're small, you're stealthy, you've got some type of sharp tooth-like structure or teeth in order to, to, to make a painless bite. You've got anticoagulants in your saliva to keep the blood from flowing. So this is convergent evolution. They didn't get this from a common ancestor, but I just found that incredibly fascinating. And, and that was really the, the, uh, the first half of, of, of Dark Banquet was, was all about the, the sort of adventures that I had as a, as a, as a graduate student at, at Cornell, um, figuring all this stuff out. So vampire bats walk on the ground and attack their victims? Sure, and then two of them, uh, so that they're not outcompeted by this incredibly well-adapted common vampire bat, which is the one that everybody sees. They're up in the trees, the other two species feeding on birds, no competition. Um, and so, so that was a, that was a surprise because when I first started working on vampire bats, the, the sort of party line was a vampire bat is a vampire bat is a vampire bat. And there are three species and sometimes they overlap. And so, you know, I wasn't convinced that vampire bats were going to be the same. You know, I'd been looking at, you know, I've been taking ecology courses and, and, and evolution courses, hearing about things like competitive exclusion, which means if you've got two different species that are that are you know that have a lot of similarities uh, then then they're not going to be able to exist in the same exact place one of them is going to have to evolve or or move away or go extinct so i looked at vampire bats species living in the same habitats and went they're not going to be the same and and lo and behold people had figured this out before me but they were you know they were they were they weren't publishing they, they were they were folks who were collecting these uh, in, in places like Trinidad, to, in anti-rabies uh, squads that went out into the country and, and netted vampire bats. And they knew a lot about these animals. And when I went down there and, and, and started spewing the party line about vampire bats, they laughed at me and said, yo, man, <laughs> white wing vampire bat ain't going to jump. Um, and so that, so, so taking it from sort of from there and, and using their expertise, I was able to, 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 to better figure out how they coexisted and how they did things differently. So, so this is like a wide ranging conversation about a book on the heart and now we've evolved into vampire bats here. So I'm bring us, gonna bring us back to the book a little bit. Um, we have another um, Patricia Wynn illustration of a giraffe. And, you know, blood pressure is something that is not, high blood pressure is not something that's it's a little important in veterinary patients. It's hugely important in ourselves. We're all worried about having high blood pressure um, because it risk, increases our risk of stroke and heart disease. So, but how does the giraffe, how, how's blood pressure different in the giraffe? And here's this very cute giraffe and his heart um, for you to talk about. Well, Look at a, a so sort of an average person's blood pressure is about what 120 over 80 something like that or we wish it yeah. was that low. When you're looking at a giraffe, uh, you're you're talking about 280 over 180, which is more than double the pressure. So that's a tremendous amount of pressure that is generated by this 20 25 pound heart, and the reason that it evolved that way is in order to send that blood up, and you can see in this, in this, in the figure, um, up against gravity, roughly 10 feet to supply the head, the brain, uh, the upper part of this animal. So, so here you have an extremely high powered system. And, 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 and that makes sense. If you're going to be tall, you've got to have a heart that generates higher pressure. That wasn't the surprise. What I found really neat were the adaptations so that, for example, um, these blood vessels under such high pressure, because take that 280 over 180 and then add gravity to it as you're supplying the blood to the legs. Uh, and now what keeps those vessels from exploding? And, and, and one of the things that, that researchers found is, is that they have the equivalent of pressure socks that we would use in an airplane. 
to to prevent the the that pressure that builds up from from basically exploding those vessels. They have valves in their um, in in their blood vessels that, for example, what's to prevent? Uh, what would keep if a, if and, every, and you can see here, here's a giraffe that is on the right. You can see it's, it's bent over and it's drinking. How does blood that is, that is being supplied to the brain, to the head, how does it return to the heart when the animal has its head down so far? Uh, and, and you know, venous blood, of course, is under low pressure. Um, and, and so what there are are sets of approximately seven different valves in their uh, in, in the blood vessels that return the blood to the um, to the heart um, that prevent that blood from pooling and and to me this is you know this was really neat stuff that if you look so, at this the, if you look at that structure the reap mirabola uh, this is this is what keeps that high pressure pressure blood from from causing the the vessels found in the brain to explode because before the blood gets to the brain, it enters into this capillary bed called the rite, um, and, and the pressure drops a bit so that by the time it gets to supply the brain, uh, it's not under such tremendous pressure. So there were all sorts of really neat things like this that are, uh, and, you know, and I found this throughout the animal kingdom where, where you had these wildly cool adaptations that, uh, that, that generally people don't know about. I know. Think about that poor giraffe's feet on an airplane. They'd be like all puffy and swollen if they didn't have that tight skin. I wonder if that's why giraffes have such spindly little legs is so that the skin, there's not a lot of soft tissue for the blood to pool in. They, they, their legs are just basically like bone and tendons with some oh, yeah. skin over very, it. Very tight. The skin is extremely tight to the uh, to whatever musculature is there. Where if people think about their dog or their cats, or if they happen to be sitting on your lap, you can take your dog or your cat's lower legs and that skin is very movable on their mm -hmm. legs. I mean, it's not baggy, like it might be around their neck or something, but their skin is not tight at all on their legs. Like I, I suspect it is on a giraffe. Horses have kind of tighter skin on their legs too, but yeah, probably for the same reason. And, yeah. and animals, you know, there are other tall animals, other some other mammals that that are that have long necks, and you and you see the same thing. And this is, you know, once again, this is convergent evolution. These are these are adaptations that evolved very separately, not from some common ancestor. So, but don't people have valves in their blood vessels, oh, in their yeah. veins? Yeah, but yeah. they're and not as good as the giraffe ones. Well, no, I, I mean, well. You find them in in veins because it, the you know if blood is pumped out at high blood at high pressure when it when it gets to the point where it has gone from a, a, from a, a, an artery to an arterial to a capillary bed and now it's really really reduced and the capillaries the diameter is incredibly small and but it's really really dense um, the because if you added up all of the the inner diameter of all of those capillaries in a capillary bed if you added that up it would be a tremendous amount of surface area. So because of that, the pressure drops through the floor. And this is great because in order for gas exchange, for nutrient and waste exchange to take place, the vessels have to be incredibly thin. And if the pressure is high, it'll blow those capillaries apart. Now, so, so now when the blood leaves the capillary and now enters into a venule and then a vein, and it's headed back to the heart now so that this whole thing can take place again, it's under really low pressure. So why for, ex why, why, for example, do we get, you know, people who have uh, uh, edema, who their, their feet swell up, their legs swell up? This is because the, the, that pressure is, is, is so low um, that that blood can't get back to the heart. Uh, and it has trouble, it pools. And, and what these valves do and you can see there's a, a you can see there's a valve there in the in the middle of this figure is that once the blood passes through the past that valve on the way back to the heart it can't reverse its course just like the valve on a you know a, a, a sump pump in your basement would do it prevents the, the the water that you've pumped out into your neighbor's yard from from going back down into the the hose and then back down into the, the into your basement same story here it's that that this low pressure system requires an assist to get that blood back to the heart.
The other thing that you see is, and you know, back in the old days, before I started working on this stuff, before I started studying anatomy, I'd look at my calf and I'd see it sort of twitching and I'd go, do I have some type of a neurological disease or, or some kind of muscular problem? And in reality, what's taking place there is that that, that is this musculoskeletal pump. There are, there, there are muscle fibers and parts of those of my calf muscles that are constricting. And, as, and by doing so, they're squeezing the veins in my calf and helping to send that blood up higher. And once it get past, gets past the valve, then it can't drop down back into my feet. So all of these adaptations are out there that, that are out there, I find to be incredibly fascinating. And that's why I, I, I fill my books with them. And see, this, this way that the muscle helps move the blood is just another example of what you were talking about before, which is the organs don't exist in, in a vacuum. Um, the, the muscle, the horse running and the liver sliding helps respiration and the leg muscles walking, moving, help move the blood flow. And that's why when you get off the plane and your feet are all puffy, yeah. by the time you walk all the way to the baggage claim, your feet are better because your muscles have moved and helped move that pooling blood along. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and so this, it, this sort of leads into why when you have peripheral, peripheral vascular problems, uh, that that it that it it can be so dangerous because the this system which is not necessarily the heart you know if if, if this system starts to break down then you have that then you have trouble uh, you have uh, you have fluid accumulating you you uh, you know that your heart has to work harder in order to pump blood if the vessels for example are not compliant if they don't if they're not stretchy um, so 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 the, these are the, you know it. it to me, those are that that's horrible. But but to me, it's interesting that you can find these examples and 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 use those to get to get information across. And and that's really what I what I try to do in in, in my books. I'm you know these are not textbooks. They're they're books that are written for for, for for people who are interested in science, but not necessarily scientists. And I and I think if you can if you can relate these concepts like the ones that we've just been talking about, if you can relate them in a in a way that is quirky, entertaining, maybe a little weird, uh, then people are going to repeat those and, and, and people are going to remember them. So this giraffe is an incredible adaptation of an animal um, to function and eat the leaves of the top of really tall trees. They're actually, giraffes have an incredible tongue. It's like a shoe, a piece of shoe leather in there because they eat acacia leaves and acacia leaves have a big giant stickers on them and the, the giraffes just eat it all down. Uh, I'd like to know what the inside of their esophagus actually looks like uh, eating those prickly acacia leaves. But in the, your book, you talk about another um, another adaptation that I thought was great. It sounds more like um, a frog sickle. So can you talk about frogs and their cold weather adaptation? Yeah, there are leopard frogs that live in northern regions, let's say northern Canada, and, uh, and, and it gets cold there and, and it freezes and, and they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't uh, migrate. Um, and, and some of them, what they do is, well, there, for, let me back up a second. There are some animals that have antifreeze in their blood. And, and so there are, there, there's a, an example that I, that I use in the book uh, about uh, the Arctic ice fish, which, which literally um, ha has substances in its blood that lower the temperature at which water freezes and water is mostly, you know, blood is mostly water. So that's one way to deal with the cold. Another way to deal with the cold is, is found in these, uh, in these northern leopard frogs. And what they do, if you were to just take, if, 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 let's say you were to take a, a frog from, from down here, and this is a, of course you wouldn't do this, and you bring them up north and you, you've got them in a, in a situation where, where the weather just turned and it, 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 it got really cold and it's below zero. Um, they would freeze. What would happen would be that the damage that would be caused would be because the, the water inside the cells would freeze. And as it froze, it would crystallize. And those crystals would be jagged ice. And they would tear up the cells. And in turn, the tissues that, that, that those cells make up would be damaged. So, 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 so that's dangerous. And that's what would happen to most animals if you were to put them in a situation where they, 
where their bodies froze. Um, it, it, it's the tissue damage that's done by, uh, by ice crystals that form within cells. What has evolved in, in the northern uh, leopard frog is the fact that the frogs are able to sequester that water. They, they release substances um, like glucose um, and, and, and like nitrogen. And that those substances get into the in, in, into the area surrounding the cells, and what that means is that there's less water that there's less water surrounding the cells than normal because the space is being taken up by by these compounds like glucose. So then what happens is is that the water diffuses out of the cells. It goes from high concentration in the cells to a lower concentration surrounding the cells. So water leaves the cells, the cells dehydrate. Now the animal is, what, what takes place is that water accumulates, but it doesn't accumulate inside the cells and tissues. It accumulates, for example, inside the abdominal cavity. So if you were to dissect one, so, so now it freezes. And of course that water, that liquid is going to, is going to freeze solid. And, but it's freezing solid inside places like the abdominal cavity. So if you were to open up one of these frogs and look inside, you know, the way I've described it, the, the researcher says it looks, it's kind of like a frog sickle because there's this ice that, that has formed inside these cavities. But the, the, the cells themselves are not damaged because they've been dehydrated. So now, so at a certain point, the heart stops beating the blood is not circulating anymore. And these animals literally can freeze for, you know, th weeks, maybe a month, maybe more until conditions are such uh, that they are able to thaw out. Uh, and then they just seem to, you know, wake up. And no, so I, I, I asked them, I was like, did anybody, has anyone looked at, are, are they clinically dead? Are they, is there brainwave activity? And, and no one seems really interested in this anymore. Back when I was a kid, everyone was into, you know, there was this story that when Walt Disney died, you know, they, they, they froze his body and it was in a secret lab underneath the Pirates of the Caribbean. So, you know, <laughs> when, when, when I was a kid, we would have been all freaked out and, and psyched about this, but not so much anymore. There's not a lot of, in, uh, not a lot of people who are excited about about the prospect of, um, of freezing organs, like you'd think, you know, so, so, so whenever that type of thing comes up, I was, you know, this is a grad student alert, you know, people who grad students who are looking for a, a for a neat, um, for a neat project. And, 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 the, and the folks that I talked to said, yeah, you're right, they should be doing this. So they didn't know if that, if there was uh, any type of electrical activity going on, but they said, yeah, that'd be pretty neat to figure out. Um, but in any event, they, they, Come back to life. They're a little bit slow, uh, and and at, at a certain point they warm up and they just you know they hop away and live the rest of the little froggy season. I it, I find that just amazing, you know, because it's very difficult. If you could do that with organs, you could save organs for transplant or something. Yeah. If you could do the put them in a solution to dehydrate them and still maintain their activity. Yes. Um, it seems like the frogs have something uh, to teach us there. Um, so now I want to change to a different topic and another Patricia Wynn illustration, and that is uh, heartworm disease. So um, the Animal Medical Center takes care of mostly dogs and cats, a few other species, but heartworm disease um, is something that we talk about probably every day here. Not, not a dog that looks like this. This, it, this is probably a fatal number of heartworms. It is not a dog with spaghetti in its heart. And um, so I want you to talk about this illustration a little bit. Well, um, we've been talking earlier, and I, I thought you made a really good point that when, when you say heartworm, it, it, you know, it's that people don't really have an image of, of, of what they are. Can you see them? It, it, you know, and in reality, they can grow up to, I, I believe, 12 inches. And, yeah. and these are roundworms that are transmitted by the bite of a, the only way that it can get into a, a dog or, or a cat or any number of other types of, of animals, including, I believe, humans, is that they're transmitted by an infected mosquito, um, and and they grow in so, so they mature uh, inside the heart, um, and once they become established, which is what you don't want, which is why you want to have your dog treated with 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 heartworm medication so that this scene doesn't take place. 
Um, and, and, and as you mentioned, you know, that they concentrate on the right side of the heart, which is, which is the side of the heart that's receiving blood from, uh, from the body. So you would think of it, that's how they get, they get into the heart is they travel via a vein back to the right side of the heart. That's the side of the heart that not only receives deoxygenated blood, but then pumps it out to the lungs. Um, and they grow in the right side of the heart. Uh, and, and, and if they get up into the vessels, the pulmonary, um, the, the, the pulmonary arteries that are, that are leading to the lungs, uh, then, it, then it becomes fatal. Uh, so, so as you mentioned, that, that this is a dissected heart, uh, that this is an animal that, that, that would not be alive if, if it got in, uh, in, into, that, into that condition. But the take home message, I think is, if you'll agree, is, is that you really need to make sure that your, your animals are, 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 uh, have their uh, heartworm medications so, so that you don't have to deal with the danger of, of an actual infection in uh, it, reaching nowhere near this nasty, but, uh, but to the point where you've got to go in and, and, and kill these worms. And then you've well, got to leave your dog yeah. out for, for months because it, it can't really get excited the heartworms are are a real problem because there are lots of good effective preventative medications which is what you give your dog or cat every month if your dog gets heartworms that the medication to kill the heartworms is nasty it's it's nastier than hemoglobin is and the other thing is it is often unavailable back ordered can't get it um, and so treating dogs for heartworms can be a challenge because the medication is not always available back order. So that's a problem as well. Now, we're lucky um, in New York, we don't see that many heartworm cases, partly because I think people know that they need to give their pet medication every month to try and prevent that. But it, it, it is a really important problem preventive healthcare thing. And this is one of those cases where an ounce of prevention is way, way better than a pound of cure. Um, because dogs, once you treat them for heartworm disease, they have to be kept quiet. Otherwise, these dead and dying worms cause blood. Well, they don't cause blood clots in the lungs, they cause worm clots in the lungs. And, and that can be fatal. Um, so treating heartworms is dicey and preventing heartworms is really easy. Um, the the first medicine to, to to well not the first but one of the medicines we use to prevent heartworms is actually a Nobel Prize winning medication um, ivermectin. Uh, I don't remember the year that the guys who invented or discovered ivermectin won the Nobel, but but your if your pet is getting an ivermectin heartworm preventative, it's getting a Nobel Prize winning medication. Um, I just want to. I can't see the clock here. My watch says it's time to take questions. Michelle, is that right? Um, I think you can keep going a little bit longer. Okay. Um, okay. So like remember, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat so that we yeah. can uh, ask them and everyone can hear your answer. Um, so I think one really interesting aspect of your book that readers might not expect from a zoologist is the fact that this book has big sections on how the heart became the exalted organ, a link between emotion and intelligence. You want to talk a little bit about that part of your book? Yeah, um, I'm a historian and, and I love, you know, I'm, I'm, the book that I'm writing now about teeth, I, I, of course, I'm looking at, at, at how teeth evolved and, and some of the neat adaptations that, that exist in nature. But I was just as interested in, in, in ancient dentistry and, 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 and what, what people used to do with their, with their teeth back in the, you know, it was, it was basically tooth worms. They believed that cavities were caused by worms. And, and this is something that also evolved convergently in humans as, and, and we think that it's because whether you were in South America or Africa or Europe, you saw what worms did to, to for example, wood or, or, or your crops. And so that when you had this tooth pain, uh, the, 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 the knee jerk reaction was to, was to think that, that worms were, were, uh, were the cause. Um, but I was really interested in, in how this concept of cardiocentrism came about. And, and that would be the idea that the heart is, is, the, is not just a, a vital organ, uh, but is the seat of the soul and intellect and, and emotion, especially emotions, strong emotions like love and hate. Um, so um, 
really, uh, I wanted to name the chapter once I got into this and started to do the investigation. I wanted to name it, you know, blame it on the ancient Egyptians, but but my editors were like, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, but 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 that's at, at least in the West, that's where where it came from. The, the, the ancient Egyptians were. were um, they saw this structure that was centrally located. It responded to stimuli. It would obviously beat faster if you were excited or being you know, threatened by a sword or something like that. And it sort of calmed down if you were you know, mellowed out. Um, and they saw this and, they, and, and they, they thought that it was wildly important and, and rightfully so. And they didn't think anything of the, uh, of the brain. So for example, when during the mummification process, they would pull your brain out of your head with a hook that they would stick through your nose and yank the brain out and throw it away. But the heart, they would put in a separate, um, in, in a separate piece of pottery. And because in the afterlife or the equivalent of the afterlife, it would be weighed against the, the, the feather of Mott. Uh, and, and, and this was, uh, basically this was going to determine whether you, uh, whether you had a good time in the afterlife or whether you were gonna be torn apart by, by, by monsters. So, so they really thought that the heart was super important. And they were the first ones to believe that the heart was, was the seat of emotions and what we would consider to be the soul. Now, when the when 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 the medicine and and the ideas that the that that the Egyptians had about the heart was picked up by the ancient Greeks, they they really held ancient Egyptian medicine and and concepts that the ancient Egyptians came up with in high esteem. So so that rolled over into the uh, to to the ancient Greeks, and so you had philosophers and artists. And then you know, there was this now explosion of art that, that moved from the Greeks eventually into the Romans about how the heart was the, the seat of the soul and the seat of emotion and the seat of intellect. Uh, and that just continued on with, the, with artist types who are still, you know, who are still doing that today. You know, but eventually, we, and it took a long time, we moved away from this concept of, of cardiocentrism when we realized, for example, how important the brain and, 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 and began to understand things like the nervous system. But it was really something that spread from, from the ancient Egyptians, this, the, this idea uh, about, the, about the heart being really uh, incredibly important for more ways than just pumping blood. I have a, I'm sorry. Oh, one oh. thing I, I, if that's okay, I wanted to, um, I was fascinated by many, many things in the book, but um, zebra fish, if you could speak a little bit about that and the idea of, of regeneration. Well, one of the major problems with, uh, with, with the human heart is that when it is damaged, that, the, that the, let's say because of uh, coronary vessels are blocked. And so the, the tissue that's downstream of that coronary vessel uh, it starves. Uh, and, it, and, if it, and if it starves for too long, uh, that, that tissue dies. One of the problems with, with humans is that that tissue does not grow back to into functional, contractile, hardworking cardiac muscle tissue. It comes back as scar tissue. And the tropical zebrafish, on the other hand, which is now becoming the 21st century version of the guinea pig, because so much is being learned from it right now. You know, we're learning about new types of cells that we never knew existed. Uh, cardiac cells, for instance, that are that are found in the heart that, that we're just discovering by by by, by doing research on on zebrafish, um, which are surprisingly similar to to, to mammals. You, you know, they're I, I don't know the, the exact I can't remember the exact percentage of similarity in genetics, but it's close enough that they can be used for for a lot of different things, and they are, and they reproduce really quickly. Um, you can store thousands of them. It's so, so it, it gets around the problems of maintaining rodents and, and certainly things like primates. But what they found out, one of the interesting things that I think you're getting at with, with ze zebrafish is that in the wild or, or in the laboratory, if you happen to be doing this to a zebrafish for an experiment, you can cut off 20% of the ventricle, the single ventricle that a zebrafish has, and it will heal itself. Uh, uh, it, 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 the connective tissue, instead of just turning into in scar tissue, will reassemble um, and then a mature muscle fibers will suddenly start to reproduce and repopulate that area. So in, in relatively short period of time, you have a completely healed heart. Now, what is it about the zebrafish heart 
that enables the zebrafish to repair such a, you know, a horrendous injury. When when we're talking about uh, something on a far less scale than, you know, people are not getting 20% of their heart chopped off since, uh, you know, they outlawed gladi gladiatorial combat. But, but I mean, it, it doesn't heal itself in, in anywhere near the manner that a, that a zebrafish heart does. So, so those are the types of things that, uh, that, that, that researchers are looking for now. And, and that was one of the neat things about this book was that, you know, I'm somebody who studied vampire bats for 30 years, I'd like to have a dollar for every time somebody came up to me and said, yeah, but how does that help my grandmother live longer? And, and here was an instance where I picked specific animals, whether it was the Burmese python or, or, or the zebrafish or the ice fish, the Ar Arctic ice fish, to come up with, with neat examples, neat hearts, neat circulatory systems, neat aspects of those circulatory systems that were applicable to, to, to researchers who were trying to improve cardiac medicine. Uh, and that to me was one of the most fascinating parts of this book. And, and, and zebrafish was, was, just, was just a small part of that. So I, I, th I think I wanna ask a follow-up question about that. And that is um, broken hearts. Mm. You talk in your book about broken hearts. So that's different that you make a distinction between that, between an injured heart from cardiac disease. So talk about broken heart syndrome. Yeah. So here I went on talking about the fact that, you know, here on this 21st century uh, evolutionary biologist slash zoologist telling people, no, cardiocentrism is not, you know, it's, we're not connected to the mind. It's, it, it's all about the brain. And, and, and that's the important thing. It's, it's not the heart doing all of this stuff. And here I come into this example of in the, you know, something like 20 years ago, researchers in Japan uh, found that there, there were probably, I think it was about 30 different patients showed up at hospitals and they were all exhibiting symptoms of, of, of heart failure, of, of, of having a heart attack. Uh, and when they when they when they put these people under uh, in, when they started to to examine the um, the, the the heart, um, you know, using uh, using uh, you know not not radiation, but but other methods to look at to to you know not X rays, but but those types of um, those types of methods. What they, what they found that there was no damage at all. There was nothing that they could see, but that the hearts the ventricles of the hearts had a weird shape. And that shape looked like these were Japanese researchers and they, they compared it to the way that the that octopus pots that were be lowered down on a rope. And there's a, a picture of it in the, in the book. And the octopus would see this and go, oh, there's a nice little home, climb into it. And they would haul the octopus up. Then, you know, now you've got, you've got sushi. And, and this was, they named this, this, this syndrome that they found in these women, and they were 95% of them were postmenopausal women um, that had just gone through some type of emotional trauma. They'd lost loved ones, they'd lost their house, they'd lost a job. They called it Takatsubo syndrome, named after the Takatsubo, the, 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 the octopus pots. Um, we call it broken heart syndrome. And, and at at best now, researchers have hypothesized that what happens when we go through these stressful situations is that, of course, your body releases stress hormones. And, and these, um, these are short-term things. Uh, and and you, you know, if you've ever been in a stressful situation and you feel your heart racing um, and you're, you're, you know, you're, the palms are, are, are sweating and, and you have all of these different reactions to this, these stressful situations, the thought here is that this is an abnormally prolonged stressful situation that these women are, are having. And because of that, the stress hormones that are normally shut off relatively quickly after a stressful situation passes, in these instances, these stress hormones are, are, are continually released and they are causing inflammation in the heart and causing this uh, these symptoms. Now, the good news is that they're that they appear to 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 uh, to go away after uh, after several months, um, but but it is something that is a, you know there's an ongoing study now and and there is now a belief that that it, that emotions can cause physiological uh, problems and and this is a case in point. 
Well, I have on my time here that our, our hour is up. Um, and I think this was, I learned so much more than I did uh, by reading the book uh, in tonight's discussion. So I hope that everybody who's here enjoyed this uh, discussion and the construction guys are back outside. I told them they could start at seven and they are right <laughs> on time. So thanks to everyone. You're gonna get a copy of this uh, emailed to you uh, tomorrow, Michelle. Yes. And yeah, so exactly, yeah. uh, you can share with your friends and some people who had to log off early can listen to it as well. Thanks so much to our guest, Dr. Bill Schutt, his book Pump, and his next book is on teeth. Uh, you'll enjoy every word. Good night. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you both so Thank much. You. This was oh, you're wonderful. welcome.